Hello again and welcome to the uh, lecture number three on the thermodynamics module. Uh, today we're going to look at the first law of thermodynamics which introduces the uh, property energy. Um, we've, we've considered on the course the system uh, prescribed boundary surrounding a collection of matter. Um, we've looked at properties of the system. Uh, a property we defined, you may recall, uh, to be uh, that which is independent of the path. So the change in property only depended on the end states, not the path. Um, and also uh, we introduced the very important property of, uh, well, we've got pressure and volume, but temperature, where we define that using, uh, in a macroscopic sense, using the Zenith law and th this idea of thermal equilibrium. Um, so that, that was quite important. Um, then we define the state of, uh, of the system. Essentially, if all the properties are defined and we know the values, we can, we have the, we can identify the state of the system. Uh, so we have this idea of a system. So let me just draw my uh, system. This is my system, uh, and the matter of interest is, is in there, and the boundary, and everything else was the surroundings, you may call surroundings. So that was the first lecture, wasn't it, where we're just defining various things that uh, we need to get started on, on thermodynamics. Uh, in the second lecture, we looked at the uh, interaction between the system and the surroundings and identified two forms of energy transfer. Uh, one of them was uh, work and the other was heat. And heat, uh, we put a, an infinitesimal amount of heat, uh, we define that as delta Q. And for work, uh, we define that as delta W. Um, so we found out that these uh, were not properties uh, and and could be defined as essentially an interaction between the surrounding and the system so heat well that was that is driven or well de defined by uh, identified with um, a temperature difference so if there's a temperature difference uh, between the uh, system and the surroundings heat transfer will take place uh, work uh, was a different type of transfer of energy um, and we identified that with the raising of a weight in the surroundings. All forms of work could be quantified. We could imagine some fictitious machine that we could build, a frictionless machine that raised the weight in the surroundings. So if we had a shaft work, for instance, um, from a, maybe a turbine or something, we could imagine attaching the shaft to a pulley system, a frictionless system that raised the weight and in that way, we could see that what was going on is that the system was transferring energy to the surroundings. The surroundings were visibly gaining energy by the raising of a weight. Um, so, and we identified sort of work with sort of ordered kind of energy transfer. We have to design things, we have to build things. Uh, as far as heat was concerned, uh, that was just a sort of disordered form of transfer, sort of, uh, it's what the random motions of atoms in the surroundings uh, transfer uh, energy in a disordered manner. So there's some subtleties, some differences between these two forms of energy transfer, but essentially just basic interactions that are going on between our system and the surroundings. So uh, also I think we, we identified some um, uh, the well in our state we mentioned in our state space we mentioned our state diagram and we de define various processes and so we define a process to be a path in the state space and also the end states um, and we defined uh, very important processes um, associated with uh, what we call polytopic processes because you may recall that for our delta w we define displacement work Displacement work. And I defi define that to be delta WD was equal to PdV. So 
So that was a quite quite an important an important uh, relationship for us. Um, I'm going to use this quite a bit on on the thermodynamics course. So also we had the shaft work uh, associated with the torque T D theta. Um, so, so that's quite important as well. Um, but also we've identified some processes. So we had this PV to the N is equal to a constant. So let's call it C. Um, and the reason this was important to us, we found it identified uh, quite important thermodynamic uh, processes. Uh, for instance, was N was equal to zero, we found that isobaric process because P is equal to constant. Um, also, when n well it goes to infinity, it goes very big. Um, we found that that gave us uh, v equal to constant, so isochoric process. And for ideal gases, we looked at the case when n is equal to one, uh, and that turned out to be an isothermal process. And these were different curves in our on our PV uh, uh, diagram, different paths, different processes. Um, well, we, this was quite useful because when we wanted to find out the work done by uh, moving from one state to another, so state one to state two, um, we want, needed to integrate this, this formula. So if we wanted the work, displacement work WD going from one to two, then we found that that was the integral from V1 to V2 of P dV. And to solve this integral, we needed to know pressure as a function of volume. Um, and for that, for pressure to be defined, uh, we found that we need to look at quasi-static processes, essentially practically very slow processes, because if we did, uh, well, we change things suddenly, you would not get a uniform pressure in your system. So we, not, we wanted sort of pressure and temperature uh, and such properties to be well defined and uniform across the whole system and for that to happen changes have to take place very slowly indeed and quasi-statically this is what we uh, we needed uh, uh, well for both pressure and temperature we needed thermodynamic equilibrium which essentially is both thermal and mechanical equilibrium uh, and that would allow us, in fact, to define pressure nicely. We'd know our pressure change and we could, we could work out this integral. For these type of processes, we found that WD 1 to 2 was given by a very nice formula. P, um, P2 V2 minus P1 V1 over 1 minus N. So we found that was the... That was the formula we worked out. Uh, just substituting this into there, doing the integration. Uh, this was for n not equal to one, you may recall. Uh, you can't divide through by zero. That was a bit of a warning sign. Uh, and we had a slightly different formula um, for n equal to one. I'm just going to emphasize something here. Notice that uh, this formula uh, has got just the end state information, but also this value n and this value of n in fact is telling us that work uh, displacement work uh, is not a property remember that the change uh, in a property only depended on the end points the end states it does not depend on the path but this n is telling me that this does that this thing depends on the path you may recall for different values of n as i've just mentioned you could identify different processes uh, for n equal to zero. That was just um, on our PV diagram, that was just a horizontal line, that was an isobaric process. So for n equal to zero, uh, we get a different different value of work. So this this can this kind of formula is sort of indicating uh, just another way of saying, look, uh, work is not a property, it's dependent on the process. Uh, that um, that you that uh, you follow, um, so that's that's one thing. So there, uh, the fact the form has got the n in <laughs> is uh, giving a bit of indication of that. So there we go. I think this is where we got to uh, last time when, uh, and you'll notice how we sort of 
fitting everything together, we sort of building up this picture uh, to do thermodynamics, uh, where the system defined, very precisely defined, uh, properties are then defined uh, precisely again, um, um, and uh, the state of the system, and then the interaction with the system and the surroundings, again, is very precisely uh, discussed and talked about. Um, well, we've got three properties that we're essentially working with at the moment. We're going to introduce quite a lot of, quite a lot more. Uh, but today I want to look at uh, the first law of thermodynamics. So the, this is the title, first law of thermodynamics. First law of thermodynamics. Uh, and the statement of the first law, it was given by Jewell, uh, James uh, Prescott Jewell, uh, who said this, he said that when, when a system executes a cycle, uh, the sum Well, the algebraic sum the algebraic sum of work transfers is equal to the algebraic sum sum of the heat transfers, heat transfers. So this was, this was a dual statement. In fact, he said proportional to, but we, for SI units, it's going to be equal to. Uh, so the system, it executes a cycle, um, and the algebraic sum of work Transfer and heat transfer uh, essentially equal. And what he's saying then in, in sort of mathematical terms, he's saying that essentially if you go around a cycle, and we can imagine a cycle uh, on our state diagram, but he's, he's saying, and I'm going to write this little squiggly circle there to indicate that I'm going through a cycle, that delta Q is equal to delta W, little cycle. Uh, the sum, uh, the algebraic sum um, of the work and the Q, so can imagine something like this, you see, I've got some uh, point one, and I can imagine going to point two, and then I can come back again, if you like, on my state diagram, I've got a property X, property Y, I don't know what they are, they could be anything. Uh, let's do it like that. Uh, and of course, during this, during this, um, this cyclic process, the system has been subjected to work and heat. Uh, it's not necessarily continuous, you know, it's algebraic, so it's, it's kind of indicating that uh, some work has been done, uh, then the heat transfer has been done, there may be more work and this type of thing. So we can imagine that during this process, We've got, uh, if I can write it like this, you know, Q, one, two, if you like, and then from this process, let's do it like that, W, one, two, uh, and then for this part of the process, we've got Q, two, one, uh, and this part, W, uh, two, one. So bits of work and bits of heat transfer are taking place, and he's arguing that uh, you get this result. Alternatively, you can write this as uh, the integral of delta Q going around a cycle minus delta W uh, is equal to zero. That's another way to write the same thing. Just taking the delta W to the other side. Uh, and that's the that was his definition of, uh, of the first law. Uh, it was given by that particular uh, that particular integral. Now it's fairly straightforward to 
uh, create and do a cycle. I think we can we can imagine one ourselves, a practical one, uh, just to demonstrate it. Cycles are quite important in thermodynamics. So we use them quite a lot, as it turns out. We've come across them again. Uh, so what we could do then is consider a situation. Let's imagine then uh, a cycle. Let's imagine a ball, a uh, very simple a ball uh, of liquid. Let's imagine that. Um, and let's imagine what, we've got a stirrer of some form, um, something like this, I don't know. Um, some shaft. Uh, we've got some blades on this thing, just run like that. Uh, and you're rotating this thing. Okay, so there's my there's my uh, system. Uh, it's got a stirrer there, and we're doing shaft work basically. That's what we're thinking about. So we're doing shaft work. Uh, w S dot. Uh, so we're, we're stirring this thing up, and then we could ask ourselves what's going on, and we could draw maybe T. Oh, let's, let's draw. T versus V, maybe T versus specific volume, and maybe we could look at pressure as well, maybe P versus V uh, on this on this thing. Uh, and we go from one point maybe at a certain temperature. Uh, and what we do when we put work into this thing, and what we expect to happen is that the uh, temperature uh, of the system will rise, uh, and the specific volume will slightly change. If it's liquid, it'll change, expand slightly, you get a little bit of expansion. So it might be doing something like this, I don't know. So let's do something like that. That's one, that's two, and we're going up there. Uh, similarly, if you look at this diagram, uh, um, well, actually, if we do, rather than do pressure versus V, let's do uh, temperature gain versus P. How about that one? That might be slightly better. Uh, so we get the same, same, same thing. So start from the same point, same temperature then. We end up going, but pressure we're saying doesn't change, I think, in this one. That's a very simple one, so that's a slightly better way to do it. <laughs> one, two. So that goes up to there. Uh, in that case, so that's we can always plot, you know, we can choose our properties, what we want to choose, uh, what's convenient, of course. Um, so there, there's two. Now, uh, well, that's gone, if you like, on this this part of the this part of the curve. We've gone from one to two. Uh, I've only used work there. Uh, well, let's do something else to bring it back. Uh, well, we've raised the temperature, so what we could do is cool it. So let's imagine that I surround this. Well, let's do the dry again. So there's my there's my system. Again, there's my water. And let me imagine uh, putting a, a, a bath of water around this thing. Colder. So this is uh, cold uh, bath. Well, cold bath. Like so. Draw my system again. There. And let the temperature of this bath be, well, let, let, imagine the bath being quite, quite uh, uh, big in size so that its temperature barely changes. But in any event, what we're going to do is imagine this coming back down this thing. This is the idea. We can imagine that we're here somewhere. This is V against T again. We're starting at point two, yes, and we're cooling it down now. So heat transfer is taking place. Um, heat is leaving the system, and we're going from point two to point one. Let's imagine that we've arranged it so that um, that's two to point one. It's meant to be the same. It doesn't look it. <laughs> Uh, in that case, and again, we could do the same thing for pressure, uh, temperature again versus pressure. We're seeing in this case, and we've gone down this curve again. So this is just an example, really. Uh, we can always arrange this. This is just an example um, of a cyclic process. Uh, so this is a cyclic process. 
process. This is what we're demonstrating here. So we've got a cyclic process where we put work and so we've stirred this thing up. In doing so, we've put energy into the system. We've raised the temperature. The volume slightly increased. The pressure hasn't changed. We've sat the atmosphere. You know, it's the it's a, an environmental pressure. So that's what it's kept at. Um, and we've we've gone up to from state end state one to end state two, uh, and then we've put a cold bath uh, in, uh, in um, of water or whatever you'd call that of liquid and brought the thing down. And that's of course not work, clean not work. That's heat transfer. There's a temperature difference between the two, and energy's flown out of the system in the form of heat in that case. Uh, but that's definitely a cyclic process. Um, which, um, which, what uh, Jewel was allu alluding to when he d defined his, um, uh, well, give his statement of the first law of thermodynamics. Well, it turns out that we can use this 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 statement here to come up with the a definition uh, for energy, and I want to show that next. Uh, so let's get rid of this. Okay, we'll get rid of that. So that's a cyclic process. Well, let's imagine then, let's imagine quite generally that we accept that we can create these cyclic processes. And let's imagine uh, our state diagram again, and let's do that, where we're going to go uh, again from point one to two by path A. Let's, we're going to do that. And we've got our property X. Probably why there could be anything, as I say, you can choose these uh, to be whatever you like. Uh, recall that we have the two property rule, of course, uh, from our um, first lecture uh, for fairly simple systems. It only takes two properties to fully define all the properties of the system, which is quite convenient. Uh, so two properties are quite important. Independent properties have to be independent. Uh, we're going to see certain situations where we have properties that are not independent. So these are independent properties. We're going from state point one, state point two. And let's imagine then that we're going to return uh, via uh, path B. Alternatively, we're going to go via two paths, to, which we're going to call C. Okay, so this is, we can see there's two cycles here. We're going from one to two via path A, so that's a process, whatever that process is, and we're returning uh, using path B, but also we could do a cycle, we're going from A and returning via path uh, C. Uh, so there's two cycles involved there. So let's look at this statement there. Let's look at this thing here. And let's look at those two cycles. So what we're saying is this. We're saying that uh, the integral, so we're going from, I'll write it like this, from one to two, if you don't mind, uh, from path A um, is uh, delta, um, delta Q minus delta W, um, So let's call, let's, oh, I didn't find that. Um, call it, let's call it, let's, let's, uh, let's call it A. Shall I make that A? Yeah, just put a little A there. It indicates that, uh, well, let's put it there. Go on, put it here there to indicate that, um, um, no, let's do it there. <laughs> so a little indicates that we, we've gone through uh, uh, path A there, and the cycle plus we go now from two to one. No, I, I, there's a better way to do that. I, I'd rather than do that. Let's. Uh, so I'm going to say one to two, then one A two. Oh, let's do it like that. Oh, that's slightly better. Yeah. So okay, let's go from so from, from using path A from one to two. Let's let's do that notation, and then we're going to come back. And we decided to come via path B. So let's go to B1. 
And again, that's delta Q minus delta W. And that, according to Joule, is saying that, well, if you go around a cycle, this is a cycle. We've gone, started at one, we've gone to two, from two, back to one, that's a cycle. That must be equal to zero. That's what Joule is telling us. That's equal to zero. Well, we've got another path here, so let's do the other path. So we've got the integral from 1 to A to 2 again, delta Q minus delta W, plus, we're doing via C now, so let's do that. We're going from 2 to C to 1, delta Q minus delta W. And again, that's a cycle that must be equal to zero, yes? Well, those two are the same, clearly. Those two are the same, and it must infer that these two are the same. Yes, they've got to be the same. Uh, um, just subtracting one equation from the other uh, gives me uh, that, particular, um, that particular identity. So we find then that the integral... So that implies that the integral so 2 to b to 1 delta q minus delta w is equal to the integral from 2 to c to 1 delta q minus delta w. That is what we have to deduce from that simple a uh, bit of analysis. Well, what it's telling us is something quite profound, I think. It's telling us that this 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 uh, difference here uh, is an independence of the path. It does not depend uh, uh, on the path. So we've took two different paths, they're quite arbitrary. So any path, I took another path, I'd find exactly the same result. Yes, these are totally arbitrary paths. So this thing is independent of the path. We can also deduce, I think, that there's no reason to suspect that the delta Qs and the delta Ws are the same here, individually. We know that uh, delta Q uh, is not a property, neither is delta W. So we can't have that, uh, you know, so if I chose a different path, the likelihood is that the delta Qs uh, and the delta Ws are not the same. So we can deduce something, I think, from this. We can deduce, it must be the case, that uh, delta Q minus delta W uh, is a property. This is what we must be able to deduce from this, because delta Q minus delta W does not depend on the path. We know properties do not depend on the path. And what we're going to do then is define this thing to be equal to uh, delta, well, du. We're going to so. Or this way, I'll write it like this. du is equal to delta q minus delta w. We can see this makes sense because if I stick it in this integral here, if I stick, if this is a property, and I call that property u, yes, and this a change in property uh, does not depend on the, uh, on the path, of course. And if I stick that in there, we'll see then, okay, I've got this. If that's a property, du yes uh, well if that's a change in property then it doesn't matter about the b because it doesn't care about b that must uh, and that must be u2 minus u1 and of course it's exactly the same thing on this side uh, 2c1 that is du That's a property, it doesn't depend on C, it just depends on the end states, clearly it's U2 minus U1. So that kind of makes sense that if delta Q minus delta W uh, is, is a property, uh, we can see that it's consistent with, with this idea. Um, so from Joule's statement, we get this result. This is the, well, this is the, Conservation of energy, really, that's what this is. Uh, conservation of energy, uh, it's the first law of thermodynamics. 
uh, and it's and which we all did introduce a bit earlier on, didn't we? In the in the second lecture, I just sort of introduced this uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, but now we can see that this is a macroscopic definition of energy. We know there's a microscopic uh, view of energy. We can imagine en uh, energy as the um, associated with, for thermodynamics and for our case, associated with the kinetic energies of the molecules. Uh, also potential energies as well. Um, um, you could also include other energies as nuclear, chemical, you know, as energies in the bonds, of course, as chemi chemistry, chem chemical energy. But for us, it tends to be uh, more to do with the, uh, the uh, energies associated with uh, the kinetic energies and the potential energies of the, of, the, of the molecules involved. So there is that sort of definition of it. Uh, way to think about it, that's a, mic a microscopic definition. But here we're trying to create a subject that's totally, just totally uh, devoid or uh, not connected to that aspect. It's, uh, it's self-contained. Uh, and we're looking at mic macroscopic definitions of energy. And we're finding uh, that we, we know this experimentally when we go around cycles with our system, uh, the algebraic sums of work and heat transfers you know, from observation, most definitely add up to zero. Uh, and because of that, we can deduce that um, there must therefore exist a property of our system. So once we've got, we've got our system now, um, so this is our system. We have our P, we've got our V, we've got our T, and we've got another one now. Uh, we've got uh, another property of the system, which is, uh, which is, well, we call this intrinsic, intrinsic internal energy. Intrinsic internal energy. We know it's, it's internal because it's coming from the, the microscopic uh, aspects of the system, as is, as is the temperature, yeah. Uh, as is the pressure, come to think about it, you know, pressure is to do with the molecules banging, about, bouncing against the wall, walls and uh, changes of momentum. You can do kinetic theory to show that. Um, uh, so, and temperature, of course, as we said before, there's a microscopic definition for that and also the risk for energy. Uh, so the, what we mean by internal then, um, it's to do with the fact that it's coming from Inside the system, it's coming from the molecules, fair enough, uh, but still we've managed to find a way to define it without, in fact, referring to that, um, which is uh, what we do in this approach, our, our approach to thermodynamics. Okay, well, this is a differential view of, um, of, of, um, of, the, of the first law. Um, we can extend this. Uh, well, we can always we can always integrate it. Of course, if we integrate this relationship between our states, and I've just done it in fact, so between state one and two, uh, du, then then we get the you know a finite change, uh, and we've also and we integrate the left hand side as well. Um, then we uh, from one to two, delta q minus delta w. Then we get this, uh, we write this as Q1 to 2 minus W1 to 2. Um, so as far as the properties are concerned, it's a difference. This is the point I want to make. We get a difference between, the, you know, uh, property is not dependent on the path. So it's defined at the end states. Yes. Uh, but we can't say the same for Q. So we, we treat these slightly differently. We know that. The heat transfer and work, um, uh, they uh, are not properties, so we have to use a slightly different notation uh, because it depends on the process, yes, it depends on the path. Uh, so if I change the path, I get a different answer here. These come out with different numbers. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, the end state's the same. Uh, then this it doesn't matter what the path is as far as this left hand side is concerned but the right hand side definitely depends on the path so that's the important point 
uh, the important distinction. Um, so that's that's quite important. Uh, the other thing we might there's different forms you can write the energy equation, and we can take into account uh, mechanical terms. Uh, for instance, we can break in we can bring in kinetic energy. We can bring in potential energy. Uh, so we can imagine a system. Uh, for instance, we have our system. Let's imagine this. There's our system. And we can imagine this system at a certain height. Um, so let's imagine some uh, Z, I don't know. We can imagine the system at a certain height. Uh, and we can imagine also it having a velocity uh, V. Uh, make that small V. Mistake, mistaken for volume. Um, so we we can say well. So the one, this this energy U, as we know, is associated with um, it's internal, it's intrinsic internal energy. Uh, but we have these sort of mechanical energies as well, do we not? Uh, so I could write the energy of this system uh, as uh, E. We'll use E uh, as U. Well, if we write Remember that U is an extensive property, so we have the mass of the system. Convenient to specify the mass here. We have the mass of the system, then we could write U as M, M little u, can't we? So this is specific, specific uh, energy, uh, kilojoules per kilogram. Yeah. Uh, so I could, what I could do, I could just write them, put the M out here. This is what I'm after. U plus a half v squared. Uh, plus uh, GZ, yeah. So we can write the total energy of the system, if you like. So this is the total energy. Total energy of the system. We're focusing on the U in this course, but I just thought I'd tell you about this as well. Um, so we end up then with the um, with the first first law in this form, rather than u two minus uh, rather than u two minus u one, but e two minus e two minus minus e one equals q one two minus w one two. So this is just a different, a more fuller form of the thing, where e two minus e one. Um, well, it's just the, you know, you probably see E2 uh, is equal to uh, M. M doesn't change for the system. It's a closed, a closed system, of course. We're not looking at open systems yet. But U, so E2 is U2 plus half V2 squared plus G. Uh, G is going to stay the same, yes, 9.81. Meters per second squared, the acceleration uh, uh, due to gravity in free fall. This is Z2 then, yeah? And E1 would be, of course, exactly the same thing, but uh, U1 plus R V1 squared minus G uh, Z1. So that's slightly, you know, a slightly fuller form of it. Uh, there's, there's lots of slightly different forms you could use uh, for this thing. Uh, another form is you can divide divide through by the mass. Uh, since we've got the mass here, uh, what we can do is divide through by mass. Uh, and you get a slightly different form. We tend to use lowercase for that. E2 minus E1 is equal to dividing everything through by mass. So dividing this formula through by the mass. Yeah, it, can, it cancels from this side, I'm going to call. So that's this thing then is equal to m bitly 2, if you like. This one is equal to m uh, e1. Okay, so that's just, so what's in the brackets there is my e2. What's in the brackets there is e1. Uh, so if I divide through this equation by the mass, I'm not changing the thing, I'm going to call this q, lowercase 1, 2, minus uh small w one two as well so there so that's a slightly different form uh specific form so kilojoules per kilogram uh that would be the units for that 
uh, so that's fairly straightforward. Uh, we also have the rate form of this equation. Um, well, we have, yeah, there's a few forms. Uh, we have also differential form, I suppose, that's the other one we have, uh, which is, um, we've already seen the differential form for uh, the intrinsic terms and the work term. But of course, we can also add DE. So this is differential form uh, is equal to delta, delta Q minus delta W. Yeah, so in this case, um, this is equal to, um, well, it's, it's slightly, well, yes. Uh, so it's a differential term, so it's D, M, D, U. Or let's, let's, well, let's write it like this. D, E as well, uh, delta Q. So we get rid of the mass, uh, delta W. Uh, uh, in that case, or just divide through the mass, uh, whatever you, then this makes it slightly easier to write this thing. So D, E then is D, U uh, plus, uh, well, D, uh, a half V squared, yeah, V is velocity, plus uh, D or G, DZ, that's the right, we'll go right back like that, can we? and that's equal to delta Q minus delta W. So that's a differential form of it. Uh, you can slightly modify that term, okay, let's do that then, DU, uh, plus, you can differentiate this thing, plus uh, V dV. Oops, what's, what's my... V dV, yeah? So just differentiate the velocity. The two comes out, kills the half off, we got V dV. That's the differentiate. differentiation of that. G dZ. That's equal delta Q minus delta W. Now it's kind of useful, sometimes it is useful to add differential forms uh, because when we've got, um, as I said, you know, it's difficult to think about it, we've lost in there, but the system itself could be undergoing quite slow changes. Uh, so uh, we can find that we can generally relate the, the deltas, delta Qs and delta, Q, uh, delta Ws and delta Qs to changes in properties. Um, we've already come across the delta, delta W equal to PDV, for instance. We're going to come across another one for delta Q. So differential forms uh, can be quite useful for that. Um, I'm not going to say much more about it than that at this stage, uh, but we will see that um, it is a quite useful way to be able to write those. So we have to be able to interpret these equations in quite a number of ways. Uh, we've also come across uh, the rate form. Yes, I introduced that quite early on. Um, so let me just go back to, remember our, let's go back to our du one first. du is equal to delta q minus delta w, that's the, so neglecting the mechanical terms for a second, this is the what we're working with predominantly. Uh, we can write in terms of rate, so let's look at rate then. Uh, in terms of rate, we can write this uh, as, um, the derivative of u with respect to time uh, dt. Everything changes with respect to time, yes? We know that the processes in reality involve time. Uh, um, and this is, uh, and we know now that u is a, is, a, is a property. So the fact I can differentiate it is, uh, is a, it's, a, it's a function, it's well defined, it depends on other properties generally. Uh, we find from the two properties rule that if we know two properties, we'll find other properties are defined. So if you know you could well depend on temperature and volume, for instance. Um, so it's a function which we can we can readily uh, differentiate. Now on the left hand side, uh, on the right hand side, sorry, um, we we don't Q itself is uh, is something we have to be wary of because it's not a property. So we don't necessarily think of Q. Uh, is itself defined, uh, not in the same way. We can write, usually what we can do, we can write Q12 and W12 um, uh, for, for finite values of energy transfer. 
But we write it like this because we're recognizing that uh, it depends on the path and we don't ever write it like this as a difference uh, because it makes more sense to do so. Um, so we don't, the queue defined at a state point is, is not possible. It's not defined in that way. So what we do for this one, we write it as Q dot. Q dot, uh, not a derivative, but a rate. And so this is a, a sort of distinction uh, brought about because of the fact we're talking about two different things. So that's dt, of course, q dot t, and mine is exactly the same thing, w dot t, um, w dot t. And of course, we can see that the dt's will vanish from this thing. And we end up then with du by dt, du by dt is equal to q dot minus w dot. So this is the rate form of the, of the uh, energy equation, uh, rate form of this law, in fact. Uh, so rate form. So that's the rate form. Uh, so we've got differential forms, we've got differences, finite differences, we, uh, and we've got rate forms as well. Uh, all different ways of representing uh, the first law of thermodynamics. Um, but very useful. In practice, when you do real systems and get on to real uh, problems to analyze, it's the rate form which is the which is the uh, important one. As far as this con course is concerned, and this module is concerned, uh, we'll tend to be focused on the differential and the different and the difference forms. Uh, also, you can write this as DE as well. So there's no, there's no difference between this. You can just write this as DE uh, by DT equals Q dot minus W dot. We have the same. And you can write it in no case form as well. Uh, you can divide, since mass is sort of uh, just a constant, clearly I can divide through by mass. So we can write this as D little e by DT. Uh, equals q dot minus w dot. So we can write this in a number of ways, uh, bringing in the mechanical terms if we so want. Um, though, uh, as far as this course is concerned, we are more focused on, on the thermodynamic terms, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there is a, a much, uh, a, even more trickier way to write this thing, which I which we're not going to cover in the course, to be quite honest, but it's useful to see it anyway. A much more general way to think about this, and that is to use a control volume. Um, I'll, just, I'll just mention this. Uh, it's the last thing I'll do for this lecture. Uh, so let's look at the control volume. Uh, uh, control volume version of the, the title. So the CV, what we imagine, remember our control volume? So I'm going to call it omega. Uh, that's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a region of space. There's a real distinction between uh, system and control volume. Control volumes are focusing on a region of space. Um, and it doesn't care about the system. It doesn't care if you've got the system in there or not uh, in some respect. So it's really quite a powerful feature, this. Um, but what we can do then uh, for the control volume, let's have a look at the, uh, which one we're going to look at. We'll look at uh, uh, the U version. So let's imagine then the U, uh, we can imagine the total energy uh, in the control volume uh, is simply this. Uh, it's an integral, or, you know, an integral over the control volume, or omega. Uh, and it's it's simply u dm. So we imagine a little version of mass in that. There's some mass in there. Uh, well, dm. We can imagine that as rho dv, if you want density uh, for a little volume. Or alternatively, you can write this as v to the minus one specific volume uh, dv. Remember that uh, density, material, material density, uh, is the inverse of uh, specific volume, yes? Uh, so 
that's, that's what that is. So you can think of our little dimash. You can always relate it back to the control volume volume. This is the point I'm making when you do this integral. So you can imagine a little region uh, in this thing. Um, you can imagine a little, a little dv, if you like. So that's my dv. You can imagine a little region of volume, a region of space. And you can imagine, uh, you can define what the mass is there. This is a sort of continuum concept. You can define your mass uh, uh, in, in that particular region of space. Uh, we can also define uh, q dot. Q dot, that, that is an integral of the boundary. It's, uh, it's an integral of the boundary. Uh, and we have a, I'm going to call it, I'm going to use a q again, but hopefully the dot, you don't understand what I mean. Uh, DA. Uh, have you used that? Yeah, I've used it, fortunately. <laughs> so here, uh, um, what I mean by this is um, a punit area, rate of heat transfer punit area. And uh, so this is the Q going into the system. Uh, we can also define the W dot. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to spend, again, it's a boundary term. These are transfers, you see. Uh, and again, it sort of brings out the distinction. Uh, and I can define that as a, I'm going to write it like this. I hope you don't mind. It's a, it's a vector. It's a product between stress, surface stress, and velocity. So it's a vector term. But as, um, as I say, we're not going to... Uh, spend too much on this but this is a more general form uh, this is a more general form so if i write the law uh, it's d by t and this again just brings out the udm is equal to gamma uh, q dot so that's q dot da this q dot by the way is per unit area heat transfer per unit area Probably should use another symbol, but I haven't. Minus, can I write that here? With this term, actually. Uh, the integral of tor dot v dA uh, over the boundary. Uh, the tor here, uh, it's a surface stress, but some people call it, well, in mechanics, we call it traction. Surface stress, um, surface stress. Anyway, this is a little bit too advanced uh, for this module, but I'm just giving you the sort of full picture. Um, essentially, this equation uh, is simply, this, this equation is just, just you by the, well, it's this one here, over here. This one here is, exact, is exactly this equation. That's all, that's, uh, what's the matter? This here, this is that equation there. And of course, you can do it for u as well. You can replace this little u by e, and you get the uh, you get this equation. So uh, so it's so this is a slightly more general form. I'm just showing you this how far it goes. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, the, the forms that we're going to be interested in. As I say, we're going to focus on uh, well, we're, we're not really going to worry too much about the talk mechanical terms. We're going to focus on the uh, on these type of equations uh, uh, in the differential form and also in the finite form. Well, I'm going to stop that there. I'm going to carry on uh, in the next uh, lecture, looking again at the first law. We'll come back to this and look at its application uh, and also introduce the idea of specific heat capacity. Uh, and also we're going to introduce a new property. We've got, we've got another, we've got, uh, We've got P, V, T, um, and U now, but also we're going to introduce the uh, property H called enthalpy, uh, which is a quite an important pop property, uh, particularly when we look at open systems. At the moment, everything is closed. There's no, there's no mass flowing out of these systems, uh, but we're going to look at that. Uh, and in particular, then, the rate form is very important for that. If, uh, when we look at flow through a system, uh, we move away a little bit from the equilibrium thermodynamics and bring rate into the, into the equation. Um, uh, so I'll stop there uh, and say bye-bye. Thank you.